Welcome to Free Thoughts, a podcast project of the Cato Institute's Libertarianism.org. Free Thoughts is a show about libertarianism and the ideas that influence it. I'm Aaron Powell, a research fellow here at Cato and editor of Libertarianism.org. And I'm Trevor Burris, a research fellow at the Cato Institute Center for Constitutional Studies. Our topic for today's episode is justice as a virtue. Joining us is Professor Mark Labar from Ohio University. He's also the author of a new book, The Value of Living Well. Before we go to the, the historical takes on the idea of justice of virtue that you outline in your paper, I thought maybe we could start by just explaining that term a bit. So what does it mean to say something is a virtue? Right. Well, the, the notion of a virtue has um, undergone quite a bit of change in Western society in the last century or so, I suppose, especially uh, relative to what the Greeks meant by it. And the sense that I'm trying to uh, deploy the term um, is one that goes back to the Greek conception. Uh, in modern philosophy, it can be used to refer to any kind of an admirable trait, um, any kind of uh, advantageous feature that something or someone has. Uh, in the 19th century, you know, there's sort of these Victorian uh, associations of chastity and um, sexual self-control. Uh, none of that is present in the, the kind of Aristotelian picture that I'm endorsing. So when I'm thinking of a virtue, I'm thinking of it as, number one, uh, a trait or quality of character. And that's to say that um, it's an enduring feature of not only someone's motivational propensities, the, the things that they find themselves gravitating towards doing, um, but also uh, a way that their apprehension of the world that they're acting in is shaped. So that, for example, um, someone who's courageous, cur courage is sort of the, one of the standard virtues for all the Greeks. Um, someone who's courageous sees the world in such a way that opportunities for courageous conduct are salient. It's, it's not the case that um, they will back away from situations that require courage because they just don't notice that um, courage is called for in a situation. Their sensitivity to the world is shaped by that virtue. So these traits like courage uh, count as virtues um, in virtue of being partly in virtue of being stable features of one's character. It's not just something that comes or goes or that you uh, find yourself for no particular reason, being motivated to act in accordance with on a particular occasion. They're stable. And for the, uh, the Greeks also, it was an important feature of virtues uh, that they conduce to one's living a life that one finds a good life. Uh, so if you can imagine, for example, uh, a sadist thinking, well, geez, I, you know, I've got the virtue of cruelty. Uh, it's stable. It's enduring. It shapes my apprehension of the world. Um, but that's not going to count as a virtue. In fact, it's going to count as a vice because characteristically cruelty is not part of uh, a way of approaching the world that we find fits with a life that's, uh, that's a good life for the person who's living it. So it's an ethical the, theory about living well. That's right. It's an ethical story and the notion of living well is an ethical conception of living well. And for This is another, I think, really important difference between us and the way that the Greeks thought of virtue and thought, for example, of happiness and well-being. Um, they did not think of those as being independent concepts. It didn't occur to them in asking what kind of life they wanted to live um, – you know, what that might be independent of and prior to thinking about the demands of morality. It, to them, uh, seemed as natural as anything to think, well, of course, uh, living virtuously is going to be a part of that. So we very often, uh, I think there's a really pronounced tendency, especially amongst philosophers, uh, maybe more generally, uh, tend to think of the world in a way that's paradigmatically modern. And we think there's a story about Ha individual happiness. Uh, maybe that's having our desires satisfied. Maybe it's experiencing pleasure. Maybe it's some more complex story. But each of us has this uh, potential for happiness 
this life that we'd like to live out. But of course, we find ourselves living in a shared world. And in virtue of that shared world, we've got to accept some constraints. And morality on this picture then is the story about the constraints that limit us in the pursuit of this uh, independent conception of what a good life for us would be. So do um, these do do these constraints then in the the virtues are are they constraining in the sense that if we didn't follow these constraints we likely wouldn't lead good lives so if we want to lead good lives we need to live virtuously which includes these constraints well I, the the contrast that i have in mind is one that really sets aside the idea of a good life and constraints um there certainly are constraints uh, built in and some of the, the virtues certainly constrain us in various ways but the idea is that the constraints are part of the life that we want to live. In other words, we're going to think it's good for us to live in ways that are not um, unconstrained in a various in a variety of ways. So we don't have a good life and then face constraints that are alien to it, that limit us in our pursuit of our good lives. And that's that uh, set of constraints being morality. Instead, the way that we conceive of a life that we want to live is one that understands that we live lives socially. And living socially means understanding that there's ways that it's good for us to be limited in what we can or do or want or aspire to do with or to other people. Then is this – does virtue ethics then, is it kind of – it sounds almost like it could be a form of consequentialism in the sense that you know what – what we want, that you know, that that good at which we aim is the good life, and if we want that, then there are these certain rules we need to follow, and so we're following them because the consequences of them living virtuously is a good life. That's not well. Depending on what you mean, I, I think it's not a form of consequentialism as philosophers normally use that term for a couple of reasons. One is that. Typical forms of consequentialism, like utilitarianism, say, are maximizing conceptions. They say there's a good out there, and what you have reason to do is to maximize as much of that good as you possibly can. So, if you're a hedonist, you know the good is pleasure, and your rational aim, insofar as you're adhering to the theory, is to either, if you're an egoist, experience as much pleasure for yourself. Or if you're a utilitarian, to maximize the amount of pleasure that's felt by all agents. So there's a maximizing notion that's entirely missing. There's no, it's not that maximizing doesn't ever show up, but it's not at all dominant in the conception of what we should do. Well, it's all more about moderation in a lot of ways, for at least it, for it, Aristotelian levels. It, in, in lots of ways, that's correct. Um, there's going to be stories about balance and appropriateness and fittingness, and none of those really fit with uh, maximizing stories. Well, if if it's not, if there isn't a maximizing, then does that mean there aren't, I guess, degrees of a good life, such that like one life could be good, but another life could be better? Because if there are, then obviously, then maybe there's a best at which we're seeking to maximize. Right. So the danger of you, – you can do that and you can um, – for just – I think just about any theory that's normative that says that um, you ought to do something or one thing is better than another, you can grammatically put it in the form of maximization. Uh, so if you're, if you're determined to consequentialize it, you can say, you tell me what you think is better and what you think is worse – uh, give me a series of comparative judgments and I will uh, give you back a formula that says you ought to maximize this, this – whatever the thing this is that's uh, comprising this scale of better and worse. But that's a, uh, that's a sort of trivial form of maximization because it isn't anything that can be um, understood or formulated. It can't figure into rational deliberations. It's entirely an ex post conception of what you're trying to do. So I think I resist the idea of thinking that if you have norms, if you say that one thing is better than another, um, it's better to do one thing than – or better to do one thing rather than another, um, that that can be put into a consequentialist framework. So the other – sorry, go ahead. So the, um, the, the other ethics, the consequentialist ethics and also deontological would be applying those too in terms of quandaries, right? In terms of actual problems, usually problems that are given to you, but that's also not what virtue ethics tends to do. Uh, no, but there are um, there are moral quandaries. I think any plausible theory has to take account of them. And uh, really good virtue uh, ethical theorists um, 
have a lot to say about moral dilemmas. Uh, Rosalind Hursthouse, for example, has written extensively on what dilemmas look like from within a virtue perspective. Um, so I don't think those go away. Any moral theory that said that there weren't moral quandaries would be a, a theory Strange. for yeah. – yeah, it wouldn't be for us. Uh, I do want to go back to the, the other point that I wanted to make against a consequentialist reading of this because uh, with the exception of uh, one ancient group, the Epicureans, um, the, the Greeks – so here I'm thinking of Plato and Aristotle and the Stoics primarily – would all have said it's not just that um, living virtuously – is necessary for giving for living a good life. They they wouldn't say just that living a good life is the goal or the end that we seek for its own sake. But they also thought also thought at the same time that virtue was desirable itself for its own sake. So Aristotle says this explicitly that um, virtue is something that's desirable both for its own sake and for the sake of something further, namely a good life. And that structure of ends or goals, final ends, um, as the Greeks thought of them, that give us reason for action. That's a structure of rational authority and value that just doesn't fit within consequentialist pictures. There's a conception of reasons for action that um, is completely wonky from the standpoint of uh, maximizing consequentialist theory. And so, as I say, you, you can, if you want, gerrymander a maximizing picture out of it, but that's the maximizing picture is going to have nothing to do with the actual constituents of what such a theory says we have reason to do. OK. Well, then let's let's turn to those – this historical account of justice as a virtue, some of the ways that various ancient Greeks and ancient Greek schools looked at it. Um, which, which seems weird by itself because we don't really talk about justice as a virtue it, seemingly in modern political discourse. Um, but historically, you say that they did a lot. Yeah, that's right. I, I think um, and one of the, the points that I make in the paper um, is that it seems to me that most modern discourse about justice is about social justice. It's about uh, the justice of societies or institutions or laws or countries or practices or what have you. Um, and it's not that that kind of discourse – uh, is completely alien to the Greeks, but it's not where their thinking about justice started. When they were thinking of justice, they were thinking of it as, uh, like courage, say, as a virtue that individual people could have or not. So in the same way that individual people uh, could be courageous, they could also be just or they could be unjust. And when they began thinking about justice, therefore, their thinking wasn't, well, you know, how do we understand a society to be just? Um, their thinking was, well, what is it for an individual to be just? Now, an important sort of qualification of this is <laughs> – a big qualification is Plato's Republic, um, which has as its explicit topic justice and the nature of justice. Um, and there, notoriously, Socrates, when, when he's being queried about what justice consists in, uh, he says, well, actually, uh, in the same way that uh, somebody who's trying to read a sign might prefer to read the larger text in order to make sense of the smaller text, we'll have better luck in understanding justice if we look at what makes for a just society and then scale back and understand how that's supposed to work um, in the individual. But I think that actually bears out my point that the question that they were asking Socrates is – um, what is it for me to be a just person and why should I aspire to be a just person? And Socrates ends up uh, introducing this end run into thinking about a just society, which turns out to be a very abstract and strange society, mostly um, I think cultivated for the sake of what Socrates thinks it will show about individuals and their moral psychology. Uh, that's its purpose. Its purpose is supposed to be exemplary. It's like it's not like they really care about what a just society is. They care about what justice is in an individual, and that's the way that Socrates chooses to go and, and make that case. You don't find anything like that in Aristotle um, in the central uh, ethical books, um, in Aristotle's ethical works. Um, justice is uh, a set of norms that govern what the just person does in treating others. Um, so if there's thinking about sort of macro-level social thinking, 
Uh, it seems to be, as, as I call it in the paper, something like a, a compositional story where if you want a just society, what you do is you have just people. And having just people gives you a just society rather than the other way around. And that would have been Aristotle's view, you think? I think so, yeah. That, uh, you know, Again, the, Aristotle is a subtle thinker and, so, and, and I'm not – I hasten to say that I'm not an Aristotle specialist or an Aristotle scholar. So I have no doubt that um, Aristotle at various points – um, feels at liberty to use justice and injustice as predicates of societies. And you, but the, the primary home for them is in thinking about individuals mm-hmm. um, and their, their characters. Can you maybe give us – you told us how Plato talks about the the justice as a virtue. But can you give us kind of the, the quick takeaway of what he actually thought justice was in the individual? Sure. Yeah. So um, what he – he imagines – so to understand what it is in the individual, he thinks, oh, OK, you can see that if we use bigger text. Let's look at the society and the society. So he imagines building a society, a polis from the ground up. Uh, and what he thinks is to have this polis uh, work effectively, there need to be uh, basically three classes of people. Um there are the guardians, uh, there are the rulers, and there are sort of the people who go around making and doing all the stuff that has to be, to, has to be done. Mm-hmm. And he thinks these, these groups have different – in the just city, they have different tasks. Um, so there's people who are going to be making laws and sort of carrying out the executive functions of the city. And then there's going to be – the you know the the militia the people that actually defend the city and uh, uh, where need be use force to maintain order and then there are those who are under the direction of the executives um, and sort of doing their own work in the city whether they're cobblers or whatever their job is and he thinks uh, injustice occurs when people in those groups ignore the tasks that it's right for them to perform and instead take on the tasks that ought to be performed by people in another group. So, you know, when the, when the warriors decide, oh, we don't just want to be in the war making business. We want to be in the law making business. Um, that counts as a form of injustice. And certainly when the, the people in the city that are answer, satisfying its appetites for food and clothing and what have you, uh, if they decide to rule, then you have a real problem. So he thinks the the justice of the just city um, is each kind of – each class or each person um, doing its own work. Uh, that's what – and that, that's the analysis he gives. It's justice is each having and doing its own work. So it's sort of being the, the proper part of the machine and, yes. uh, and, and fulfilling your role in the right way. Is to practice justice as a virtue. That's right. That the justice of the city consists in each each of those parties exactly performing that task in the whole. And so then there's a direct analogy he thinks um, to the human uh, psyche, which uh, at least in the Republic, not everywhere, but in the Republic he thinks of as having uh, three parts. It has a a rational part that really sort of should be the ruling element. Um, it has a passional. Uh, part, emotional part um, that comes to the aid of reason, right, in, in say, in getting angry and striking back if, if attacked. Um, and then it has a desirous part, an appetitive part. Um, and each of those parts uh, has its own function to play in the economy of the individual. And a just individual is one in which each of those parts is doing its own work, in which uh, – and and injustice occurs when you have either the passions or the desires attempting to take over the task of ruling. Uh, that's what injustice is. It's right where, where appetite, you know, and the, the characteristic form of um, injustice is um, a pleonexia, which is overreaching or greed, right? And the idea is you can sort of think of that Plato's thinking, well, think about an unjust person, say, who's grasping or cheating or something like that. What's going on is their appetite for the goods that other people have is overreaching the rule that should be that they should be imposing on their own appetites in favor of getting these objects of desire whatever they are so his diagnosis of that form of injustice is just that you know the appetites are running the show it's not no longer the the ruling part the reason 
that's running the show for them. It's these appetites. They've taken over. They're not doing their job anymore. They have a job and they're not doing it. And the rational part has a job and it's not being allowed to do it. And so things have gotten right. wonky. Yeah. In, that's right. Inside the soul of the just person. Uh, and then bad things are going to happen. And he, he extends the anal the analogies to dysfunctional forms of government. He thinks those are all have analogs inside uh, people whose souls are are failing to satisfy the requirements of justice. But the the just soul, the one that has this virtue, is one in which each of these parts is doing its own work. And then his but his student Aristotle had a different take on this, right? A different sense of what it means to have this characteristic of justice. Yeah, typically, uh, yeah, Aristotle uh, doesn't tell that kind of story. Uh, he, when he's writing about uh, justice as a virtue, uh, he's mostly writing about the, I mean, th this is now a, a modern, and maybe it's just my idiosyncratic way of casting this. Aristotle is thinking about there being norms governing the actions that the just person performs. So, for example, in... Uh, distributing some good, uh, you know, suppose we've got a, a pie or something like that, uh, and I see that there are eight of us, um, at, and each of us is entitled to an equal share. So as a just person, I'm going to cut the pie into eight pieces or something. Um, but then I then let's say we go into business, and uh, you and I go into business, and uh, you put up 90% of the capital, and you do 90% of the work, and you know, I'd put up 10% of the capital and do 10% of the work, and now we have $100 in profits. If I'm a just person, I'm not going to say, well, okay, let's go 50-50. That's not right. Um, you know, the the return that each of us gets needs to be proportional to what we've contributed. So the just person is going to be engaging in distribution in a way that's fitting with something like the bases that we see uh, meriting or justifying the distribution in these particular cases. So, so that's justice in distribution. There's also uh, corrective justice. Um, if uh, you know, if I steal from you a hundred dollars, um, uh, a just judge, somebody who's acting justly, is going to take from me the unjust addition that I've got, and it's going to restore it to you, making up the unjust shortage that you have. So there's sort of an arithmetical. Mm -hmm. um, Restor target. Restorative element. That, yeah. That's restorative. That's right. So Aristotle's thinking about these uh, about justice in terms of these norms and trying to understand um, what what norms I think it is that are guiding the just person insofar as they're engaging in these various different kinds of transactions with other people. And then the, the Stoics, you also say, have a have a different view too, yeah. that, even than than Aristotle. Well, the Stoic view, the Stoics fit into this story in a I think a significantly different way. They actually say very little about justice per se. Uh, they don't, uh, I mean, it's not that they are not cognizant of it or don't mention it, but it doesn't play uh, any kind of significant role in their theory. Um, in the paper, the role that I give to Stoic thinking about justice is that the Stoics for the first time think, um, think as cosmopolitans. They think in the sense that they think um, the bounds of moral obligation don't end at the borders of the polis. There's not something distinctive about what I owe to another person uh, as a person that changes if you're, you know, not Greek or not Athenian or something like that. Instead, in virtue of being a person, in virtue of having this rationality that they think is uh, central to human agency, that's what entitles you to uh, to certain kinds of, of moral consideration, and that's new. That and clearly, I mean, that this happens within a couple hundred years of Christianity. Christianity is influenced uh, by cosmopolitan, the cosmopolitan element in Stoic thought. Seems like an, these, an important development. It's a huge development. It's it's really important for for Western thought. It seems uh, pretty that, modern too. I mean, it, that's it seems the way that a lot of us think about how we ought to treat other people and. It is. There's, uh, there's an ongoing debate amongst political philosophers as to the extent to which um, cosmopolitanism, uh, sorry, cosmopolitanism is right as opposed to – think. so th there's a real uh, challenge to a lot of modern political theory and practice posed by cosmopolitanism precisely because the cosmopolitan thinks that 
political boundaries are not significant or salient moral boundaries for lots and lots of reasons. I think for me to discriminate between someone who's my countryman and somebody who belongs to another country as in terms of there being significant moral differences in terms of what I owe them, um, there's not much difference. Uh, and so there are others who think, you know, cosmopolitanism doesn't make very much sense. Of course we have significant obligations, uh, to, uh, people in our lands and our societies that we don't have to others. And that's, that's an ongoing lively debate. I, but I think the cosmopolitan, I think the Stoics, established terms for that debate that uh, I think the burden is to show why we should think that political boundaries have uh, any kind of moral significance. And then the the last Greek um, school that you talk about, the Epicureans, at least in the, the quick version you give, seems even more like how we often think about modern political questions. Yeah, I think you're right about that uh, in, in a couple ways. One is that uh, the Epicureans are much closer to this modern conception uh, of uh, that I was describing earlier of thinking that uh, morality and moral norms function as constraints on an independent pursuit um, of our own happiness. Uh, they are they're hedonists, and so they're thinking the happiness is a certain kind of state of the soul that you're trying to that you're actually trying to maximize. And um, but you know we live in a shared world. And uh, justice uh, is a way of uh, peacefully mediating the conflicts that are going to arise. And so they have this sort of uh, what's come to be thought of as a contractualist uh, view of justice, that it's, it's a matter of making, striking a bargain between ourselves and others um, to limit our pursuit of our own happiness if they will do likewise. So it's a very – it's a, it's a much more modern – Social contractarian, uh, almost. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And the other, th- the other thing for them is they that's different um, is that uh, they alone of these ancient schools don't see the virtue as being good for its own sake. They think virtue is good merely in terms of the further purposes that it serves. So they're instrumentalists about virtue, and that too is, I think, a much more modern uh, notion. So there's a there's a number of ways in which they they uh, sort of stand out as exceptional amongst the, the uh, Greek schools. And then you in in the paper you then close out your section on historical accounts of justice as a virtue by jumping quite a few years to <laughs> to Kant. Yeah. And a few – yeah. And also many people would think jumping schools. Uh, in a, it, Kant doesn't seem to be much concerned with virtue. That's sort of a classical conception. But but you bring us some interesting points about him. Well, he is. Uh, Kant certainly does have a theory of virtue. But that that's uh, I, I think not at the center of his view. Um Kant is interesting from my perspective uh, because he he's uh, he's one of I think two major bridges uh, from the ancient world to to the kind of discourse that we find ourselves engaging in and thinking about justice now. The other being David Hume, whom I don't talk about in the paper, but uh, Hume certainly has an extended discussion of justice in his work, and Kant re- is responding to Hume in much of what he does. Kant is thinking of justice not a, a, as a property of individuals, but he's thinking of it as a property of interactions between individuals. Uh, and he thinks there's a story to be told about justice that's pre-political. That is to say, um, we we can speak of relations between individuals um, as being subject to the demands of justice. And we can do that independently of thinking about um, a political order or a state. And in fact, the, his thinking about why we have states and why we need states follows as a consequence of his thinking about just relations between individuals. So he's not, he's not thinking about justice as a virtue, but he is still thinking about justice as being, so to speak, a micro property, a, a, a property of individuals and their relations Rather than as a story of a, rather than as a macro property of larger scale public inst- social and public institutions, that's right. And but you then you then make the argument um, when you move into kind of talking about the virtue of justice and from a modern standpoint that I think one of the one of the concerns you have about all of these accounts is that they don't quite get is it the reasons for being just right and this is somehow tied into what you you call second person. Reasons for acting? Yeah. So the the line of thought about second personal reasons is it's a pretty recent development. This has been within the last 
uh, 10 to 20 years in uh, Anglophone moral philosophy. Uh, but it's a line of thought that actually goes back to Kant and uh, his uh, immediate heirs, uh, Fichte in particular. And it's of noticing that there's at least two different ways of, importantly, different ways of thinking about why it is that we might have reasons of various sorts to treat others with respect, let's say. Uh, so Steve Darwall and, uh, is the one who wrote a book called uh, Second Personal Standpoint back in 2006, in which he develops uh, the idea of second personal reasons. And, and it's, I think it's been influential on a number of people besides myself, but I think it's certainly germane here. Darwall's thinking is that uh, one way of understanding our reasons for treating other people well, let's say, you know, not uh, assaulting them or something like that. One way to do that is to think about, think about others and our obligations to them in a way that, say, consequentialists might think about them. And, and that would, way would be this, that we'd think, well, there's some value out there. Let's, let's say it's happiness. Um, and, uh, and I'm under a rational imperative to maximize that happiness uh, for a variety of reasons if I engage in assaulting other people. Uh, I'm actually going to be destroying happiness. It might make me happy, but it'll make you sad, and it'll make you sadder than it'll make me happy, certainly in the aggregate. So if I'm really responding to that value appropriately, I'm going to forbear from assaulting you. And the reason that I have for assaulting you then on this picture um, runs through the interest that I have or the reason that I have to promote that value namely happiness or maximum total happiness or something like that. Uh, that's one way of thinking about how it is that we might have responsibilities to treat other people. Uh, that's, uh, that's the contrast class for what Darwell is interested in. Darwell thinks the other way to think about the reasons that I have uh, for not assaulting you have to do with some story about my apprehension of you and the fact that you and the kind of being that you are, um, who you are, um, itself gives me a reason and not to assault you. And, uh, and it does so in a way that's, uh, that fits much better with our moral practices. Well, it sounds uh, almost like means to means are an ends type of concept. Uh, well, it, it, it can, uh, there's a Kantian way of putting this point, which is treating others as means and not merely as ends. But there's a point to this um, to this story that uh, Darwall picks up on. Darwall and uh, 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 T.M. Scanlon's the other a major figure in in modern contractualist thought who's developed this point. And they bring out this feature that's actually missing in Kant um, and and doesn't develop really until Fichte, and that's that um, if I assault you. The problem isn't, so to speak, just what I've done to the uh, compilation of happiness, but I actually owe you something. Um, if I assault you, you and I are in a two-personal moral relation, that, and, and you have a standing with me. You have a uh, bearing on what I ought to be thinking about that nobody else has. Um, you're in position, for example, to forgive me. I'm in position where I'm accountable to you for what I have done to you or for what I'm thinking of doing to you in a way that I am not to anybody else. And if we think that our responsibility is to promote the value, it's very hard to see why you as my victim should have this special moral standing. Let me give you an, uh, an example of where something like this occurs and we get this curiosity. Uh, this is going to be another historical example and it's Locke. So in, in Locke's, uh, Locke's second treatise, uh, Locke start, begins with his conception of the law of nature. And he says, look, you know, here's the story about the law of nature. The law of nature forbids us from harming others, and it actually requires that we help others under certain conditions. But we can advance our own interests, but we must, must not harm others. And Locke says, and the reason for this is Locke's got a, a sort of standard theistic story here. We're all God's creatures. God made us. We're God's property, actually. 
um, God laid down this law, and God is authoritative, you know, gets to, to give us the law. So you and I are under this law, the law of nature, because God has made us uh, and we're his property, uh, which, which is good as far as it goes. But now it turns out that if I assault you, we say, well, you know, whom, whom have I offended? It turns out the person I've offended is God, right? I, it's God's law that I've broken. Now I've broken his law by assaulting you. But it's sort of, you happen to be just sort of the occasion on which I offend God. I violate the obligation that I have to God. Surely there's a story about something that I've done to you. And of course, Locke thinks we can punish and all kinds of things like that. But the first, but that sort of ultimate moment of moral accountability is to God as the author of this law. Uh, and that from the standpoint of this sort of second personal way of thinking about moral requirements, that has things um, 180 degrees back to front. The first point is that I'm responsible to you for not assaulting you, for treating you respectfully, treating you well. The first point is that I'm accountable to you when I fail to do so. And the problem that's there to be fixed is with you. Others may have an interest in this. God may have an interest in this. But the first point is that it's a story about the relation between us. There's a second personal relationship. And I have a second personal reason um, not to assault you that arises from you, not from a value, not from a law, not from anything else. So if if this reason arises from the other person, how does that tie into a virtue ethical account that the you know that the ultimate reason behind these virtues and behind behaving in a certain way and having these characteristics is because it leads to or is part of or is constituent of the good life for yeah. me because this – and this gets to an objection to virtue ethics that I have heard from others that it it gets exactly this kind of problem of moral motivation wrong because it ties everything back to what's good for me. Or perhaps yeah. if you didn't have the second person conception, then you would use other people to maximize your virtue indiscriminately. I mean, is that part of the idea? Well, uh, not really because uh, I think um, the ancients can say this, uh, that – Virtue is is going to involve an appreciation for other things and people. For example, Aristotle has a wonderful discussion of uh, friendship uh, in which he, there's a really rich appreciation of what other people can can be as friends. Um, and so, so I think I, I don't want to go so far as to say that um, it, it would sort of be open season. <laughs> Uh, from a virtue perspective, without this kind of insight, but I do think this is a place in which there's real advance in the last couple hundred years in our understanding of these features of our moral lives that the ancients didn't have. And but but your question is right on the money. Uh, this is a, it's a, a it's a deep question, and for many people, it's not just for many moral philosophers, it's not just a objection. It's um, the objection, it's a show-stopping objection to virtue, virtue account. Yeah, right. And in particular, the Aristotelian kind that I'm defending, that it looks like, right, if virtues are traits that you're supposed to have for the sake of being happy, well, now uh, the suggestion is that we're supposed to have reasons coming out of the nature of other people. Um, you know, which is it? How are these compatible? And that's reconciling those points has been my project now for a number of years. And I, I have a paper that came out uh, a few years ago with a sort of preliminary take on it. And the book, which I published last year, has that as the concluding payoff. And, it, and it's actually not an exaggeration to say the rest of the book was written so that I could write that chapter. Because I think getting that story straight is something that requires um, careful thought about both what our good is like, um, what our reasons are like, the sources of reasons, what it means to see other people as giving us reasons, how the reasons that we have in virtue of the nature of other people fit in with this sort of ultimate end uh, of being happy, uh, of eudaimonia, to use the Greek term. Uh, and and that's, a, that's a messy picture. I think it does work. I think the story is right. Uh, and a big part of it is that uh, goes back actually to the feature of um, consequentialist thought that I was complaining about earlier in claiming that um, on the, the Greek view and Aristotle's view in particular, 
Uh, there's no incoherence in saying of, say, the virtue of justice, uh, that it's good for its own sake and also good for the sake of a further end that it advances, namely being happy. Um, that structure, that, that rational structure of having ends that are good for their own sake and also and, – and that not being in competition with saying, oh, yeah, and also they serve this end – to me, that's the key in being able to meet that objection. It and also seems to have some intuitive appeal to a, to a large extent. I think so. I, I think actually the structure of thinking about ends in that way is really natural. We think about it in uh, – I think we think sort of implicitly uh, in that structure about a whole lot of our goals and ends that we see them as worth doing for their own sake at the same time recognizing that they advance other of our ends uh, in doing so so that they have both – to use the Greek term, the, the final value, the reason-giving force, uh, and then also uh, serve these instrumental purposes. And that, that the, the story that I want to tell is uh, that insofar as justice as a virtue involves um, seeing others in these second personal ways, uh, that that means that I see you as uh, being a source of reasons for me, there's just things I'm not going to undertake with you because, you know, I, I will, uh, you know, use a hammer to pound nails, but I'm gonna, not going to use your hand to pound nails, uh, partly because I recognize there's a big difference between you and a hammer, right? You're a person and the hammer's not. And that's, so that figures into my reasoning, um, and I, I'm, when I am thinking about how I'm going to treat you, uh, the reasons that I see as provided by you are for your sake. You are the source of reasons that I have. Uh, but that's compatible with my thinking at the same time. It's really good for me. It's good for me that I am the kind of being that is capable of standing in this relation with you and of seeing you as being um, a person who's reason giving in this way. And those two stories about the kinds of reasons that I have, uh, they're connected, they're related, they're deeply related, but they're really answering different questions. One question is, um, how should I treat you? What are the permissible or good or advisable or virtuous ways in which I can engage with you in our dealings? Uh, and there, the answers to those questions are provided in the first instance by the kind of thing you are, namely another human being. The but second question is why, why then I should, why then I should care, uh, why I should be the kind of being that treats others that way. And now there's a story about my happiness. But that's an answer to a different question. So I think your your objection is sound. In fact, Darwall explicitly claims that the story about second personal reasons is not one that will fit in a virtue uh, picture. So I, I think that's a it's a very widely shared objection. I've tried to meet it, and and I think it can be met. And this is all in your book. So if if we want to see how you meet this question, we should look there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the value of living well that uh, I published last year through Oxford has it's really that story sort of from the ground up and concluding with an account of their what I call accountability relations. It's it's this way of seeing ourselves as engaged with others in this second personal way in which it's not just that they give us reasons, but we're accountable to them for how we act on those reasons or fail to. Then I guess let's let's go into the kind of the last section of your paper where you take all of these ideas and use them to suggest ways that we can think about justice as a virtue today and specifically you end up – you create this kind of distinction between what you call compositional conceptions of justice and structural conceptions. Right. So the – that contrast um, really captures the point that I was making earlier about uh, what seemed to me – again, these are very broad pictures but a picture from the ancients and thinking about – justice as a feature of individuals and even in through Kant uh, of their relations to modern work on justice in uh, especially in political philosophy and political theory where justice in the first the justice that we're concerned with is a property of institutions societies practices laws it's uh, almost as if people wouldn't even think of it as a quality like the idea of the just society being something where all the people are being just that's really not how we talk anymore that's right. So you can imagine two different. You can imagine someone agreeing with that and saying a just society is a society of just individuals. Um, but that way of putting things covers uh, two different ways of understanding what that relation is, and that's what the distinction I'm uh, 
that between the compositional and structural stories is supposed to be. One way of thinking about that is to say, uh, yeah, the uh, the individuals in the just society are just individuals because they are complying with or are elements in a scheme of uh, of social organization. That's just. So the society itself is just, and the justice of the individuals somehow has to be understood in terms of that social structure. Which That's sounds the, kind of like Plato, uh, oddly. Y- 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 with the uh, – mm, I'm going to say no. Okay. <laughs> uh, so so uh, justice in indiv- – so yeah, there's – at a first pass, that's true, that in the just city – well, actually, there's a big problem with understanding what Plato thinks about that in the in the Republic. Is in the just society where each is doing their own work? Does that require that the individuals have just souls? Uh, Plato doesn't say, and and scholars have beat each other's brains out. So okay. I'm not sure about that. It's certainly not true of the idea of justice in the in the individuals, where you have the rational, the uh, emotional or passional, and the appetitive parts each doing their own work. There's no appeal or reference in that. To, in uh, roles or, to yeah. being – right. That you don't have to be – that story does not for it in itself require living in a polis. Now, causally, Plato has no more idea that people would be just – would not live in a polis than Aristotle. They, they're assuming that. But that that micro-level story doesn't depend on the macro story. Um, so really the, the kind of person that sort of emblemizes this is John Rawls um, where we have uh, – in theory of justice where we have – principles where, where, where Rawls' target is uh, the basic structure of society. And the basic structure of society is the primary bearer of the predicate of the, or the property, justice. So the, what we're interested in is having a just society. What's a just society? Well, it's a society, it's a big complex story. Um, and I, no matter what I say, I'm going to oversimplify it. But, you know, the, the big story is it's, char- it's characterized by the basic institutions that shape people's prospects in the society being, um, being determined by these two principles of justice that we determine through this uh, deliberation in the original position and on and on. The basic point is the quarry here is what the property of justice is as it pertains to a society. And then the story about individuals, uh, there's nothing that Rawls says that prohibits individuals from being just in this society, but that the justice in individuals is going to be informed by and shaped by um, the the primary picture of justice as a property or of the institution. Possibly even subjugated too in the sense that if, jo- if John Rawls is talking first about structural justice, which at some point requires uh, methods of acting and behaving in order to maintain that structure, maybe they will be asked to do things that are contrary to their personal justice as a virtue issue. Well, you know, that that was Robert Nozick's intuition. And uh, part of the prompt for me in this paper was uh, criticism uh, that Nozick leveled. This is in Anarchy, State, and Utopia, just a year or two after Rawls wrote the, the book. Um, Nozick isn't talking about justice as, uh, as a virtue. Um, but he's thinking about – he does think about uh, people's judgments about the significance of dessert and of you know, people having what's coming to them in either a good way or a bad way. And Nozick thinks you know, our judgments about dessert are uh, – of course, we do have institutional – we do think about institutions as needing to, to provide those. But there's a sense in which there's nothing about dessert that depends on institutions – um, you and I in our transactions, I can see, you know, back to my little mini business idea, I can see that if you put in 90 percent of the capital and done 90 percent of the work, you deserve 90 percent of the profits. That's a micro level sort of non-structural determination. And Nozick argues that in Rawls' theory, um, those judgments seem to be floating in space. There's no place for them. Uh, they might be subordinated, as you say, to – in fact, they likely are going to be subordinated to the principles that sort of come downstream from these broader structural uh, principles. So the, 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 other, the other way to think about this relation between individuals and societies is what I call the compositional account. And there, right, we could say we've got a just society and we have just individuals. But there – and this, this I think is explicitly Kant's story – uh, there, 
we, we call the society just or the society is just precisely because individuals are comporting themselves justly with each other, um, either through the virtue of justice or through justice as a property of uh, their transactions as Kant thinks about it. But the story that we tell at the top level about the society is one that's built up um, of a whole you know, host of um, uh, individuals and their character traits and the ways that they engage. Is that a, I guess, more demanding standard in the sense that in the, in the structural conception, a society is just if this handful of institutions, say, um, propagate just rules or are themselves just – but in the compositional conception, does it does that mean that society is only just if everyone in it, or at least a majority, possibly? Yeah, some some you know critical yeah. mass is behaving justly. Well, well I, I think feel, it would be true that a more the more people that it seems like it'd be more just. If, if, probably, except so. for just one person is just the only unjust person. Yeah, then that would be. But presumably, there's more people than institutions. Yes, yeah, true. Right. Depending uh, on how you define them. Uh, that that has some intuitive appeal. I don't, I don't have worked out. Uh, in fact, what what I'm doing in this uh, paper that we're talking about here is sort of sketching the distinction and thinking this really would be good to explore because it seems like these are different ways of thinking about uh, the the sort of macro level justice and micro level justice. And I haven't done that thinking. Um, I'm I'm hesitant to think that it would be more demanding. Um, if you if you think about um, so so I'm thinking now of Rawls for example and. The moral requirements on citizens in in Rawls' just society are pretty substantial, and uh, Rawls thinks that um, individuals are capable of uh, responding, recognizing the authority of the norms of social justice and responding to them and um, internalizing them. And so, all those amount to a significant degree of. You might, I mean, if, if the demandingness is supposed to be a measure of the degree to which individuals find their treatment of others governed by norms of justice, I think there might not be very much to choose between the two. I think it's really going to be a story about uh, the priority in our understanding of the origins of those norms. Do, do, we, do we think about the norms? So each of us are, are moral agents. Each of us is a moral agent. And we're engaged in um, relationships with others of all kinds, friendships and commercial engagements and all kinds of other relationships all the time. Um, and we have to understand what norms are going to guide those relationships. Um, and so the one way to think about it is, well, let's start from this, from the idea of the society that we think is just and try to work our way back. Uh, I suppose with Nozick, I'm skeptical about that. And, and one thing I'm skeptical about is that, and this was Nozick's intuition, we're, we feel much more confident, um, in the aptness of our judgments about, particular moral requirements at the micro level. I'm much more confident um, that uh, in our business where you've done 90% of the work that you should get 90% of the confident of uh, the profits. I'm pretty sure about that. What do I think about corporate tax levels in a just yeah, society? Yeah. I have, I have no clue. I don't I mean, it's not that it's not that we can't work our way to an answer to that. It's that that process of is going to be quite circuitous and informed by complex empirical issues and so forth in a way that, my apprehension of what I owe you as an individual, second personally, is not. There's an immediacy to those relationships and to the authority that other people – that we can feel it's good for us to experience others as, as uh, having that kind of authority over us in virtue of the kind of being they are. That's immediate and I think clear. Not, not, it's not that there's no moral quandaries and it's not that it's uh, – always transparent, but the force of that apprehension I think is quite a different thing. So do you think that possibly um, – one thing I thought when I read your paper was that maybe something had been lost uh, by going over to the structural conception of justice so much to the point that we we talk about it as a just society and as a role to be playing. So you think about um, – people who sort of divorce agents of the state or divorce themselves from whether or not the structural system is just and maybe if we asked, are what you d- is what you did today just and asked everyone to think about that way, we could have a better society? I'm very sympathetic with that. And in fact, I think one of the places um, where this thinking in these terms can be helpful precisely is in thinking about agents of the state. Uh, you know, I, you read these stories about um, – you know, various forms of police misconduct and, well, yeah, you don't, it doesn't take very much imagination. You think, you know, 
why is it that so so one question is what's going on with these agents what's going on with these cops that you know shoot people in their beds um so something has gone wrong but there's something wrong with the rest of us that we're willing to put up with that and think well gosh i guess you know if the police do it it's okay or something uh, and I think it's because, to, to some extent anyway, it's because we've gotten blinded by this focus on we need the institution. You know, we believe that we need police. We need law and order. Uh, so there's this macro level story about the society that we live in. And now we see the particular officers as playing roles in that. And we've lost sight of what it is either for them to be um, just or at the very least to treat others in a, some way that's comporting with justice uh, in their relations with other individuals. And so I, I think that's exactly right, that there's a lost perspective that's really, really quite problematic. So you've certainly given us a, a huge amount to think about. Um, so thank you for that. And, and I'm, more good reasons to hate puppy side and, and police misconduct <laughs> yeah, exactly. too. So it's good. So but for, our, for listeners who then want to explore these topics more, can you point us in the right direction? Uh, sure. Sure. Um, Fortunately or unfortunately, most of the pointing probably has to be to my own work. Uh, I, I, I think that uh, I'm kind of swimming upstream here against uh, the current of a lot of work in, in uh, modern moral and social philosophy. And I don't mean to say that, that's, that, that it's unfortunate that people are really thinking about just societies. But I think there's something lost. And the toehold that I've tried to get, um, I think, is uh, this angle on thinking about virtue, thinking about seeing others – uh, as reason giving in a way that doesn't run through the story about the state uh, or institutions. The book that I published last year um, is uh, The Value of Living Well is the main place. Uh, this article um, uh, that uh, uh, we've been talking about is another. I have an, uh, an article in a collection uh, by Dan Russell. Um, the article is called Virtue and Politics. It's a, in a Cambridge uh, – Cambridge Companion to the vir to Virtue Ethics, uh, where I'm making uh, related points. Um, but mostly this is a research program. So in this particular paper, I'm, I'm sort of floating the problem that I think, in all honesty, I think it's really Nozick's problem. I think Nozick was worried about this, and uh, he was right to be worried about it. I think he ran out. He didn't – he wasn't in position to say very much more about it. I, I've – wanted to develop a moral theory that could put us, or a theory really of rationality, practical rationality, and uh, making sense of the reasons that we have for seeing others in certain ways, treating them in certain ways. Uh, and the book is really setting the, the foundation for that. So I hope to be doing more. Um, right now, that's about all I can, that's about, about the best I can suggest. Thank you for listening to Free Thoughts. If you have any questions or comments about today's show, you can find us on Twitter at Free Thoughts Pod. That's Free Thoughts P O D. Free Thoughts is a project of libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute and is produced by Evan Banks. To learn more about libertarianism, visit us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.